Good evening and welcome to Cornerstone. We're so excited to have you here tonight. I just want to say it's been a long, what is it, Wednesday? Three days with kids starting school and stuff like that. So I just encourage you to get some energy. I encourage myself to get some energy. <laughs> and any other parent that's here right now that feels like this whole new way of learning and stuff is just very stressful, I just thank you. We'll just let's pray over right now. Father God, we thank you for this evening. I thank you, Jesus, that we set aside all our cares and concerns, Father, and all the, the things that happened today, Lord, and we just take this time right now to worship you, Father, to hear your word, to speak truth. I thank you, Father God, for anointing the worship and the word in each class tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.
Welcome to Cornerstone. We're excited that you're with us. We've got a praise report. Our thermometer keeps rising. We are up just below $6,000 raised for our panels. Thank you, Jesus. I know that some other people said that they've already got some more money in the mail, so by Sunday, maybe even next Wednesday, we'll see. It should be going up even further, so we're excited. I spoke with the guy today who makes these panels over here. And uh, the price that the more I talk to him, the price keeps getting lower and lower. So we're excited about these over here. <laughs> uh, been laying out some different design, different designs with him today about how we're going to hang them, how we could possibly hang them, what it may look like, sound like. Uh, so we're excited. Amen. Amen. Good things are coming. Keep 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 the keep the thermometer rising, and good things are coming for for that part of it. Amen. Uh, thank you, Father. Let's go ahead and uh, receive our tithes and offerings tonight. Okay. If you need an envelope, somebody can get you one of those real fast. If you're just writing a check out, you can just fold it in half and throw it in the bucket if you want. Of course, you can give online at our website. You can still mail a check if you'd like to the post office box. There's lots of ways to give. There's two devices in the foyer that you can give. and We take cash. <laughs> we don't have any coin to give any change back like the rest of the world apparently. but. Uh, I'm just teasing. Father, we love you, and we thank you for the opportunity to be here. I thank you, sir. We've been praying all day for every member of this church and everybody that's streaming by online tonight. I thank you, Father, that we came in today excited. <clears throat> excited and ready with anticipation, Father, of all the good things that you're going to do in and through us tonight, Father. We thank you for impartation. We thank you for your word and, and revelation from your word. Have your way in this service, Master. We are yours. We are yours to command. This is your church, Father. So we thank you for letting us be, be part of it. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Oh, come behold the works of God, the nations at his feet. He breaks the bow and bends the spear and tells the wars to cease. Oh,
He begged her to do something that was impossible in that time. He wanted her to go before the king, which basically was like facing death. So when we read this scripture, it says, If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief from the Jews will arise from some other place. But you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this. Wherever you are today, perhaps you were made who you are for such a time as this. I know you were made who you are for such a time as this. If you're a teenager who's looking at the world and there's so much that is wrong with it and there's so many worldly things and you are just attacked every way that you look, God made you for such a time as this so that you would stand up and not be like the world. So you would be a light in darkness for the parents are struggling with decisions to make. God made you to be parents for such a time as this. So that way you would stand up and fight for 
your children and make the right decisions. If you're a grandparent, the same thing. If you're just a Christian in this room, God made you for such a time as this so that you would stand and push back the darkness and tell Satan that he has no hold and no power here. That we would not be a church that would stand by silence and let everything happen, but we would fight and we would witness to people because they need it. The rapture will happen. It will happen. Do not hold back on telling somebody the gospel. God made you who you are for such a time as this. You know, an interesting part of Esther's life that I don't hear a lot of people ever mention is that her mom and dad died. You know, talk about living in a, in a tore up, tough life. Before God ever asked her to do anything, she dealt with her mother and father dying, right? She lived with her uncle. Why? I don't hear a lot of people mentioning that. Times are tough. Sometimes life's tough. But we still have a call upon our life to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all nations. We still got a responsibility to go out and save people who need help. Amen? So the encouragement today is, hey, no matter how tough it may seem, don't quit now. Keep moving. But don't do it in your own strength and your own power and your own ability, not by my might or my power, but my, by God's power. Amen? Amen. I was sharing something with my children earlier today out of Psalms 139. You guys have a seat for just a second. Kids, we'll dismiss you in just a second. <clears throat> Psalms 139, verse 1, New Living Translation says this, O Lord, you have examined my heart and you know everything about me. <clears throat> of course, this is David talking. It's obviously pre-Jesus being born, but he's calling God his Lord. He had a heart after God. And he says, "If you've, you, you have examined my heart and you know everything about me. Listen, we can, we can play church all we want. We can act one way, you know, in the factory or, you know, you can come into this church. A lot of people, I've seen it through the years, a lot of people have came in. They, maybe they raise their hand in worship or throw a couple bucks in the plate and they walk out of here feeling like they're okay. But the bottom line is that God knows your heart. He knows everything about you. He knows your true intents, your true motives. He knows what you really think. Um, even if you never say it, God knows. You know what I'm saying? He knows if you're deceptive. He knows if you're evil. He knows if you're good. Right? right? You know my heart. You know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts, even when I'm far away. Anybody ever, feel, have, ever have moments where you feel like you're far from God? This is saying God never left you. He knows your thoughts even in those moments. Next verse says, you see me when I travel, when I rest at home. You know everything I do. There's times I travel alone. You know, God still knows everything I do. You know, that's called the fear of the Lord. When we walk in that understanding that nobody ever may know what I'm doing, but God knows. You know, that's the fear of the Lord. When we walk in this life, you know, the Bible says, judge, uh, man who judges himself will not be judged. <laughs> right? We need to live with this eternal, eternal mindset. We need to become eternally minded. That one day I'm going to stand before Jesus Christ, and Pastor Matt's not going to be standing next to me. It's just going to be me and Jesus. And according to the word, Dr. Barkley, who's my pastor. Right? And we're going to have a conversation. You see everything I do. You know everything you do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, says the Lord. You go before me. You follow me. Before me and after me. Listen, did you? God is omnipresent. You can't get away from his presence. Amen. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is so wonderful, it's hard to understand. Verse 7, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. 
If I go to heaven, you are there. If I go to the depths of the grave, you are there. If I'm riding on the wings of the morning, you're there. If I dwell in the farthest ocean, listen, God is saying on every mountaintop and every valley moment, I'm there. I've never left you. I've never left your side. You're not on your own in all of this. I'm with you, putting my hand of blessing on your head. Next verse, even in the darkness, I can't hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Dark and light are the same to you. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. You see the heart of David here? He's just examining his life and thanking Jesus and thank God the Father. He's thanking his master, his Lord, for all of the wonderful things that he has done in his life. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was even born. And every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment laid out before a single day passed. Do you know that you were created for a purpose? You were created on purpose <laughs> and for a purpose. And that God has a plan. He, he's not up in heaven trying to figure it out. He's already got your entire life wrote in his books. If you'll just follow his plan, he's already got it all figured out. How precious are your thoughts about me? You know, I remember when my children were young, um, you know, Alicia's little baby running around, just little expressions that she makes and little words that she's starting to form. And, you know, every four or five minutes, there's something that a cute little kid does that just kind of gets your attention. And, oh, man, your, your thoughts towards them are precious. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God? They cannot be numbered. I can't count them. They outnumber the, sands, the grain of sand. I wake up, you're still with me. 23 is really where I'm trying to get to. And, you know, I told this, you know, we, we started homeschooling this week, so we start every day out now where we're, we're doing a devotion in the morning, we're praying, we're starting school, school day out, seeking, seeking our Father. And this verse, I think, can be the most powerful and the most dangerous, ver one of the most powerful, one of the most dangerous verses if you really understand what it's saying. Here's David standing before God, and he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts, and point out anything that offends you. So that I can be led along the path of everlasting life. He's saying, Listen, God, I give you all of me. And I, I, listen, a person who has a heart that's completely after God wants to be like Jesus in all things. And so I'm telling you that if you understand this verse, your heart is, I want to be like Jesus, and you pray this prayer, you better get ready for the Holy Ghost to show you some things that you may not like. Because it's going to force you to change. Yes. You know, my, the Bible says that, that my people perish for a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding. I think it's people who call themselves Christians who don't get in the Word of God and find out all the areas of their life that need tweaked. This is saying, search me, God. Test me. Filter me. Sift me. Point out to me anything that offends you. Because at the end of the day, that's all I care about, Father. Are you and me okay? I want to be righteous in your sight. If there's something I say or something I do, or I, you just don't like the way I put this there or this there, whatever, I want to do your will. I'm asking you to go through all through the day, Father, and just show me things that offend you and lead me in that path of everlasting life with you. If you'll pray that prayer, I believe the Holy Ghost will give you that kind of wisdom, but you better get ready. Because right. it's going to begin to point things out that you may not like. But it'll be for your good and for your benefit. Yes. Amen? Amen? Let's walk in the fear of the Lord where we truly want to be like Jesus, where we truly read the Word of God and take it to heart and do it. I'm telling you, time is short. Yes. Jesus is coming. You better get ready. I, I, can't, I can't say it more. I, I'm saying it more and more and more. Get right, stay right. Get right, stay right, because Jesus is coming. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on. All right, you're already sitting. I know I did this to you. Kids are dismissed.
Give somebody a high five as, as they're going. We love you. Teachers, I call you blessed and anointed. for this man, um, I don't know where I'd be actually because he led my whole family to the Lord. Back in the day, he was actually praying to get out of a, a business, a job that he hated. And the Lord said, pause, got to stay there a little bit longer. I got somebody headed your direction that, that needs some attention from you. And here comes my dad, who is one of the roughest, gruffest guys I think you probably had ever met at that point in his life. Maybe, I don't know. He was a rough guy. I was afraid of him. <laughs> But uh, lo and behold, the, the Lord used Chuck Wagner to uh, lead my dad and my family ultimately into the, into the church and ultimately to the Lord. And I, I stand in, in honor of God often, thanking God for, for your influence in my life and your wife. You guys are pillars in this church, you're a pillar in our, in our lives, and we truly couldn't be who we are without you. So we thank you for that. And I know you're not going to be here this Sunday for your birthday, so we want to give you a birthday bag and just say happy birthday to you now, and we love you. Amen. Amen. All right, Jen, come on, bless us, please. Oh. Good evening. All right. So let's go ahead and open up in prayer. Father... I thank you, first of all, for the opportunity to be here tonight. Lord, I thank you for everyone who's been able to make it out tonight, Father. I pray right now that you would stir us up, Lord, that you would get us ready for the word you're about to bring. Father, use me to say whatever you want to say. And Father, I pray that whoever needs to hear it would hear it tonight. Thank you for everything you're going to do. In Jesus' name, everyone says? Amen. 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 So I'm going to go ahead and put you guys on the spot tonight. Does anyone remember what we talked about last time I was up here? It wasn't too long ago. Oh, good job. Person I don't know in the front row. <laughs> Husband. Good job remembering that we talked about remembering. So last time I was up here we talked about looking in the rear view mirror of our lives, taking the time to slow down and look back, not to dwell on the mistakes we've made or sins that have occurred in our past, but to focus on the God who delivered us from those places of bondage. Yep. We learned that God does want us to remember our past because there are benefits for believers when we remember who God is and what he's done for us. What were those benefits? I'm glad you asked. The first one was that when we look at what God's done, it helps us during the hard times to remember that if he was faithful then, he will be faithful now. Secondly, looking back over the times God has moved in our lives will inevitably lead us to worship. Remember that it, there is a direct connection between praise and remembering what God has done. Next one was that remembering the works of God in our past keeps our minds and hearts focused on him. We are reminded that everything 
comes from him, and we could do nothing in our own strength. And lastly, as we remember and focus on what God has done for us in the past, it can help us avoid the trap of sin. Taking time to remember the powerful works of God in our lives slams the door shut on Satan and temptations that he constantly hurls at us. Okay, so now that we are all caught up on what looking in the rearview mirror looks like, tonight, let's shift our eyes from behind us to in front of us. Tonight's message is called Looking Ahead. Christian, we are different. If you didn't already know it, we are to be different. We don't have to be like those who wonder if everything will be okay. We don't need horoscopes, fortune tellers, or the news to assure us of our future. We don't need to tie ourselves up in knots with worry about tomorrow. Why? Because Jeremiah 29 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. There's the word we're looking for, hope. The Bible is the most hope-filled book ever written. It tells us that we are a people of hope, that we are saved by hope. Our God is a God of hope, and the word was written for our encouragement that we might have hope. That's what looking ahead is. It's hope. So take a walk with me. Let's dig a little deeper. What exactly is hope? Usually when people talk about hope, it's in a wishful thinking kind of way, like, I hope tomorrow is a better day, or I hope my job pays me a bonus this year. Yeah, me, too. me too. And, you know, I hope my husband brings me a coffee at work. That's an actual quote from myself this past Sunday. It didn't, it didn't happen, though. <laughs> It's okay, it's okay. Oh, take it easy on him. He's done it before. Sorry, babe. Sorry. They were, about to, they were about to jump on you. I'm sorry. He's done it before, I promise. Okay. It didn't happen, which brings me to my next point. Clearly, this kind of hope may or may not come to pass. And that is where the difference between the world's hope and biblical hope lies. So the English word hope according to Webster's Dictionary, means a confident expectation that a desire will be filled. When the Bible uses the, the word hope, it uses it in the same sense. But there is one important difference with the meaning of the word hope in Webster's Dictionary versus the meaning of the word hope used in the Bible. The hope in Webster's is based on the idea that a person is pretty sure that things are going to work out. For example, you work hard in your math class. You've done well on the assignments and all of the previous tests. So rightfully so, you hope for a passing grade on the final. Based on what you know, your hope to pass the exam is legitimate. It makes sense. It sounds right. But what if there's an accident on the way to the test? Or you had a bad night before the exam? Maybe the teacher threw in some questions based on different material not covered in class. In other words, the hope referred to in Webster's is uncertain, unsure, it's wishy-washy. You are pretty sure, but you're not 100% sure. But when the Bible mentions hope, it's talking about something that is 100% sure. The Bible uses the term hope when it refers to something that is not yet present or visible, but is certain to take place. Do you see the difference? Pretty sure versus 100% sure. We all know that we are saved by grace through faith, right? Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift from God. We all know that, right? Faith is necessary for our salvation. But we don't often speak of hope as part of it, too. But we really should, because hope is an essential part of faith. Take away hope, and the definition of faith in Hebrews 11.1 1 is disabled. Look at it. 
Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So think about it like this. Think about a tall building, right? One of the most important parts of its construction is something you can't even see. That is the foundation on which the building is built. The taller the building is, the deeper the foundation must be. And the stronger the foundation is, the more difficult it is for any force of nature to bring that building down. Just like that, our hope is like that tall building powered by our faith, the foundation. Our faith in God is what underlies our hope. The deeper our faith is, the more difficult it is for our hope to be shaken or overthrown. Paul shares this same kind of hope in Romans 4.18. Let's look at it. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. We know Abraham as the father of faith, right? He was one of the walking examples of faith, what faith looks like. And the faith Paul is speaking about in this verse is the faith that God would fulfill his promise by giving him a son, Isaac. So this was a faith in the future work of God. Verse 21 makes this crystal clear. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. Hope is faith in the future tense. Okay, so from the ordinary human standpoint, there was no hope at all. Abraham was too old to have a child, and his wife Sarah was barren. She couldn't have kids, probably because she was too old too. But biblical hope is never based on what is possible with man. Biblical hope looks away from the man to the promise of God. Whenever faith in God looks to the future, it can be called hope. And whenever hope rests on the word of God, it can be called faith. Amen? Hope is powerful. And if you don't believe me, I want to share something with you. True stories that are tough to hear, but show the true power of what hopelessness can do to a person. So early one March morning, Heidi, who was 15, and her boyfriend Christopher, who was 16, decided life wasn't worth living anymore. So after a short hike down a rugged path on a cliff overlooking the Pacific Ocean near Los Angeles, the teenage couple ducked through a hole in a chain link fence to get to a narrow concrete spillway known locally as the diving board. There, before dawn, the couple jumped, falling 150 feet into the crashing surf below. Their bodies were found by a jogger at sunrise. Two months later, and just a few miles down the coast, 14-year-old Amber and 15-year-old Alicia also decided they'd had enough. After tying their wrists together, the two teens walked to the edge of a cliff and jumped. After their suicidal leap, many of the girls' classmate, classmates gathered on the cliff to light candles, play music, and mourn their loss. One classmate offered this philosophy about life. You know, Life sucks as much, so much as it is now. A lot of teenagers don't know if it's going to get better or not. I guess suicide is their only way out. They feel they can't talk to people. We don't feel like we can talk to our parents or anybody. They say they understand, they don't. These true stories of Heidi, Christopher, Amber, and Alicia represent a hopelessness that's flooding today's culture in extraordinary ways. To some, life seems so worthless that they're, not, they're willing not only to kill themselves, but to take others' lives as well. And families and communities, communities are left devastated. For others, depression isn't strong enough to make them consider suicide, but it is enough to make them feel lonely, unloved, and miserable. The enemy is taking hopelessness and having a field day with it. No hope. You know, when we come into this world, when we're born, we're not born with eternal life. We're not born with hope and peace. We can't buy them. We can't earn them. 
So there's only one way left to get them, as a gift. And Jesus is the only one who can offer it because he was able to do for us what we were unable to do for ourselves. I assure you tonight, whether you are in this room or you are watching this video, that as long as God is on our side, life is never hopeless. Hope's job is not to make you feel cheery and carefree. Hope's job is to anchor you, to ground you, to keep you close to the rock of ages. Hope protects you. Friends, this is where you come in. The world is searching for this hope that we have. All you have to do is spend five minutes in Walmart and look around at the people. You can almost see it. It's almost visible, the desperation for something more. And we have that something more. We have what they are constantly searching for. And they need us to step out of our comfort zones and share the hope that we have. But you will miss a lot of opportunities to share this kind of hope if you yourself don't experience it. If you yourself are not consuming the word and growing in faith and hope. And if you yourself are not even sure that the God who, that we put our hope in is in the business of fulfilling all of his promises. In order to share this kind of hope, we must walk in this kind of hope. Amen? So even though life for Christians is never hopeless, it sure can feel like that sometimes. One, trials can cause you to become weary in your mind. And two, during those trials, the enemy is at hard work trying to cause you to abandon your hope in God. Notice how I said that. The devil can't take your hope from you. But through his attacks and deception, he can cause you to throw away your hope in God if you let him. That's why we need to constantly guard our hope. And how do we do that? By growing our faith in God, which like a tall building's foundation keeps our hope strong. And the best way to do that is by faithfully studying the Bible because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The stronger your faith in God is, the more immovable your hope will be. So regardless of what you feel hopeless about, the truth remains, you do have hope in God. So don't go by what you feel. Go by what the word says, what God says about you and your situation. Then, by faith, say, thank God I have hope. David, the psalmist, wrote in Psalms 27, 13, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. There's a story of an old sailor who looked at the skies and saw a dark storm coming. And as the sea became rough and choppy, the old sailor calmly lowered the heavy chained anchor, link by link, fastened down the hatches, and he went to bed and slept soundly through the night. He knew the storm would be rough, but the sailor had faith in the grasp of the anchor. He knew his boat would be there in the morning. As a follower of Christ, we too have an anchor called hope that helps us weather the storms of life. In fact, the Bible describes this hope in Hebrews 6, 19. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. The Amplified Version says this, this hope, this confident assurance we have as an anchor of the soul. It cannot slip and it cannot break down under whatever pressure bears upon it. A safe and steadfast hope that enters within the veil. Listen, I can't promise you happiness and I can't promise you restored relationships I can't promise your world will immediately turn right side up. But I can promise that God will receive you as you come in faith. I can promise that he will be your strength when you cannot go on. He will be trustworthy when everyone betrays you, when nothing else is certain. Hope will anchor you 
to the safety of God's mercy, and no storm can break his hold. Amen? You know, one of the first lessons a plain pilot learns is to trust his instruments over his feelings. Why? Because there will be times when a pilot loses his sight as he flies through storms or heavy clouds and in situations with limited visibility. A pilot can easily become confused about their flight positions. Is he flying right side up, upside down, straight? Is he going zigzag through the sky? The gauges, meters, and compasses are the only trustworthy sources of information as the pilot navigates through these types of difficult situations. So a pilot's feelings may mislead, but his plane's instruments provide him with the true information to keep him focused and keep the passenger safe. Life sometimes feels like we're flying through a storm, doesn't it? We bump up against different, difficult circum circumstances, find our faith shaken by loss, lack, or trials, and sometimes we struggle to bring together the feelings we're experiencing with the wisdom we know from Scripture. A lot of times we'll reach out to social media, to the news, to our friends, and try and use them like air masks to maintain some sense of control. But what we really need is the life-giving air of our hope in Christ. Like the pilot who can't navigate when his visibility is blurred, we lose our biblical perspective as struggles and difficulties distract us from the promises of God found in the word. Our hope is an unshakable confidence in God, even when circumstances give us every reason to doubt. If we let hope be based on circumstances, then our hearts are tempted to look at our situation and judge God's faithfulness by what's going on around us. Do I have enough money? Are my kids healthy? Is my marriage strong? Do I feel appreciated and valued? If yes, then God is good. But what about when there's not enough money in the budget? What if your child is ill? If your relationships with your husband feel strained? When you feel overlooked and unappreciated and the world keeps knocking you down, what then? You run the risk of your feelings pulling you to a place of wondering if God's even good and if he even loves you. The result of circumstantial hope is despair. If we're not sure of what an outcome will be, it can leave us with fear, greed, anxieties, and even depression. But as Christians, we should know hope in a different way. We should know that hope in an unchanging and eternal God is always a certain thing. So tell me if you've ever been here before, or maybe it's just me, where sometimes I like to lead and I'll bring Jesus along for support. Some of you know what I'm saying. For example, you might make godly plans, but not follow God's plans. You put your hope in things that don't last or are just as broken as you are. You know, I have been on the top of a mountain built on circumstantial hope, and I've fallen. And trust me, it hurts when you hit the ground. But what's worse is I would dust myself off, give myself a pep talk, only to climb up the next circumstantial hope mountain and fall again. How many times do we have to hit the bottom before we put our hope in our creator, our way maker, peace giver, life sustainer. You know, losses, disappointments, death of dreams, these are real mountains to climb. So how do we turn these mountains of sorrow into mountains of hope? We don't, but Jesus does. As the hope giver, Jesus wants us, through our tears, through heartbreaks, and through the pain, to let him lead us over these mountains. So how do we let God lead? How do we break this circumstantial hope cycle? We must find our hope in Christ and in Christ alone. 
When we say, I find my hope in Christ, we're referring to believing in the work of Jesus on the cross and the future promise of God found in the word. And since we believe in the power of Jesus' resurrection and his ability to use all things for our good, we know for certain the eternal outcome for those who believe in Jesus. Look ahead with me. Our future will be heaven, worshiping God and experiencing ultimate joy and satisfaction with our Savior. No matter what comes between now and then, the end of the story has been written and sealed into eternity by the redemptive work of Jesus. When we stop to look at the cross, we see that God the Father gave up his precious son for you and me. When we were still his enemies and we enjoyed our rebellious ways, you see, even on the darkest day in history, hope was alive. Romans 8, 32. Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? In Christ, we have a fixed point of God's faithfulness to us that is more magnificent and wonderful than any other display of love. God has given us all that we need through Christ. So will he let us fall when the weight of the feelings, our feelings feel like they're crushing us and we can't see if we're flying upside, or up, right side up or upside down? Certainly not. The truth is that life is full of unfair suffering, painful consequences of sin, and just a general brokenness. But we can find a deep comfort in knowing our God is exactly who he says he is. And since we trust that God has secured our future, we can look ahead and stay focused on his promises and his commands no matter what we experience in our day-to-day -day lives. Our hope in Christ is an eternal thing, but it's also a present thing. We know the eternal future of those who love and serve God, but we also know that Christ fully identifies with our weaknesses right now. He gets it. When we snap in irritation at our kids who spilled their milk for the 27th time that day, we remember that Christ's grace calls us to gentleness and self-control. When we slowly pick up 38 Legos and 19 hair clips and 11 stuffed animals from our children's room, we remember that Christ humbled himself to serve and we're called to do the same. This hope, it's a present hope because we have a present living savior. Amen? So Paul may give us the best example of hope in Romans chapter eight. Let's look. Romans chapter 8, verses 24 and 25. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Like we talked about it earlier, I believe that every Christian has gone through or will go through a dark night or two where deep doubts and fears flare up but extinguishing those fears is as simple as staying in the Bible, faithfully, day by day. When the Apostle Peter wrote what we now call his first letter, he addressed it to the people who were both God's elect and exile scattered. If ever a tribe longed for better circumstances, if ever a people needed hope, Peter's audience certainly did. And so the Apostle offered them this encouragement. First Peter, three and four. What a God we have, and how fortunate we are to have him, this father of our master Jesus. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. And the future starts now. God is keeping careful watch over us in the future. The day is coming when you'll have it all, life healed and whole. You see, in this passage, Peter doesn't assure them the persecution will die down soon. He doesn't claim God will reward their faithfulness and suffering with health and wealth. He doesn't paint them a picture of the day when Christianity becomes the official religion of that empire. Why not? Because he knows better. Peter knew what happened to John the Baptist. He saw Jesus and Stephen in the hands of angry mobs. He had lived in exile as both a Jew and a Christian, 
And according to John, Jesus even warned Peter about the kind of death he'd experience. So no, Peter doesn't sing his readers a cheesy version of the sun will come out tomorrow. Instead, Peter holds out to them a living hope created by a resurrection that trumped the worst of circumstances. Christians back in that time faced great threats, verbal abuse, physical mistreatments, and even death. So Peter told them what they needed to do to stay ready. 1 Peter 1.13. So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the word, world. In other words, Jesus conquered death and he's coming back and we will join him and receive our inheritance. Peter said to press on, friends, look forward, put your hope in King Jesus, commit your ways to him, stay the course. We are a people of true, unfading hope. Acts 2, 26. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope. Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God has wonderful plans for your life today. He has a future designed for you that's even greater than the past. In Isaiah, we see a passage where God reminds Israel of her remarkable past, Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. But forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do, for I'm about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. God commands them to not forget. But why? He instructs the people to remember for a reason. God was about to do something new, something unseen before. And like we talked about last time, to remember the past only assures us that as we look ahead, we can expect an even greater future. God even goes as far as to say that the past is little compared to the future. So when you're stressed or burdened by the circumstances of life, find comfort in knowing that God has given you a wonderful gift. It's the ability to look ahead. Even when your situation seems dark and cloudy, as a child of God, the future holds a promise of victory. And you may be asking, how do I hold tight to the promise of those brighter days if everything around me is just dark? Then I'll tell you, do what Jesus did. When faced with the ultimate horror of the crucifixion, Jesus lifted his head and he looked ahead. He chose to focus his attention toward the joy that the day ahead of him would bring. Hebrews 12, 2. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God, he could put up with anything along the way. Cross, shame, whatever. Instead of feeling defeated by your present situation, focus ahead in the same way that Jesus' constant view of the future made it easier for him to endure the pain and suffering of being crucified. Hope is important. In fact, it's so important. It's one of the three things that the Apostle Paul said are eternal, last forever. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. So no matter how serious your circumstances are, they are subject to change. But hope in Christ is not. Psalm 39, 7. And now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. You know, when the Apostle Paul suffered his infamous thorn in the flesh, he pleaded with the Lord to take it away. Let's read it, 2 Corinthians 12, 5 through 10. That experience is worth boasting about, but I'm not going to do it. I will boast only about my weaknesses. 
If I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing so because I would be telling the truth. But I won't do it because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message. Even though I have received such wonderful re revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul hoped for relief. He wanted that thorn gone. He begged God three times to take it away. Paul hoped for better circumstances, but ultimately he hoped in the Lord. In that instance, God didn't take away the thorn. Instead, he gave Paul grace, power, and his presence, and that was more than enough. As Christians, we may or may not receive what we hope for, but the one we hope in stands ready to give himself enough, ready to give of himself instead, and that is more than enough. You know, our health may fail. Our relationships and careers may run off the rails. The economy and nations may collapse, but Christian hope lives because our Redeemer lives. Hope says God has not abandoned us in the world. His story is that he pursues us, he dwells in us, intervenes for us, and he will not forget us. Deuteronomy 31, 6. So be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and do not panic before them, for the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. There will be tears in our eyes, but he will wipe them away. There will be death and decay, but he will cause newness and resurrection to spring forth. While the grave remains, for now, it's hope that erases its victory. And while death remains, for now, it's hope that has wiped out its sting. Amen? All right. It all started on November 16th. 1952. Charlie Brown explains to Lucy, all you have to do is hold this ball, then I come running and kick it. Lucy's not so sure. I don't know if this is such a good idea. Charlie Brown comes running, but at the last moment, Lucy pulls back that football, explaining to the kicker, I was afraid your shoes might get it dirty, Charlie Brown. I don't want anyone with dirty shoes kicking my new football. He tells her, don't you ever do that again. Do you want to kill me? This time, hold it tight. She does. So tightly, he kicks the ball, which doesn't move, and he tumbles onto his back. I held it real tight, Charlie Brown. Lucy would continue some kind of football snatch in almost every upcoming year of that strip, all the way to 1999. Drawing the strip for the last time, Charles Schultz said that he realized, sadly, that Charlie Brown would never kick that football. But he also th thought having him succeed would have been a disservice to his character. Why? Maybe Charlie Brown trying to kick that football reveals who he is. Depending on your perspective, either he doesn't learn from his past or he refuses to give up in his future. For the Christian, it's the latter, which is what makes Charlie Brown something like a Christ-like example. He doesn't give up, he doesn't quit, and he lives in hope. In Christ, we see God's perfect power and faithfulness to fulfill his promises and his infinite love in suffering and dying to save us. 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal comfort and a wonderful hope, comfort you and strengthen you in every good thing you do and say. When anxiety, fear, discouragement, or confusion wiggles its way in, we may find ourselves asking, or someone may be asking you, what reason do I have for hope right now? 
Let's go to Psalms chapter 130. The title of this chapter says it all. My soul waits for the Lord. In this chapter, we'll end with this. We find five clear reasons believers have to hope in the Lord. Number one, hope because God hears you. Psalms 130, 1 and 2. From the depths of despair, O Lord, I call for your help. Hear my cry, O Lord. Pay attention to my prayer. When you pray, whether in gratitude, pain, or confusion, your prayers aren't dissolving into thin air or disregard it for more important prayers at the moment. God hears your prayers. He's ready to listen anytime, day or night. He doesn't get distracted, impatient, or irritated. Even if you've prayed the same prayer hundreds of times, he doesn't roll his eyes and dismiss it. Our Heavenly Father never misses a word we think or say in a prayer. Even when you feel like God isn't there, he is. He's there planning the next steps of your life. He's not letting you go through the pain alone. You can find hope that you have an advocate and teacher walking with you each step of the way. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? Number two, hope because God has mercy on you. Psalm 130, three and four. Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, who, O oh Lord, could ever survive? But you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. You know, the psalmist sees God's glory and therefore sees that he, he can't possibly stand before a perfect God apart from God making a way for him. And God has for all believers. He's extended his mercy to those who put their faith in Christ. We have a reason to hope because God has offered us forgiveness in Christ and therefore has declared us righteous. Romans 8, 1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Number three, hope because God speaks to you. Psalms 135. I am counting on the Lord. Yes, I am counting on him. I have put my hope in his word. God's living and active word is a miracle. You do not need to wait to hear from him during disastrous times because all you need to do is open your Bible. God's provided a means for you to know the truth and to be sanctified by it. You know, we don't have to travel this life alone without any resources to strengthen our fight. The word is the sword of the spirit. So we can hope because God gives us all we need to live wisely, to be nourished, and to be equipped right here and right now. Number four, hope because God will return for you. Psalm 136, my soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. A watchman is simply a person who keeps watch. And in Old Testament times, this person would be assigned to watch over a portion of land from a high city wall. It was their job to spot intruders and guard against invasion. Christians hope for the morning, the day when Christ will come on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory to establish the new heaven and the new earth. And he instructs us to be watchful for this day, not to sit back in despair and not to become distracted by this world. We are to be actively engaged in waiting, which means we are on guard against the power of sin at work in this world and in our own flesh. We hope because we know what's coming in Christ's glorious return. It is expected and it is sure, just like the morning. And finally, hope because God will finish the work he began in you. Psalms 130, 7 and 8. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is unfailing love. His redemption overflows. He himself will redeem Israel from every kind of sin. God finishes what he starts. When God saved you, he began an incredibly good work in you to transform you to the likeness of Christ. Everything you go through is controlled by his sovereign hand. He won't fail. There won't be any unfinished believer in heaven. God works in your life every day, 
And at the day of Jesus Christ, you will be like him. You have every reason to hope in God. If God has started a good, powerful work in you, then he certainly will bring it to completion. Philippians 1, 6. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Hope will fuel your faith and take you to a place of victory through Christ Jesus. His promises are his will for you. So no matter what, look ahead. Don't give up. Don't quit. Get your hopes up. Amen? Amen. So Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the hope that you've given us, Father. I thank you that we can look ahead and see the promises you've given us, and Lord, and we are certain that you will bring them to pass, Father. You know, we know that you work everything out for our good and that you love us, Father, and that you have only good for us, Lord. So thank you for the hope that helps us continue to go on, Lord, that keeps us strong, Father. Thank you that we can take this hope and share it with those around us, Father. Help us to reach out like you want us to, Father. Thank you for everything you're doing, Lord. I pray that you continue to build us up in this hope, Father. Thank you for everyone here. Guide them home safely. Protect them. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Doing that, amen. Uh, just a couple quick announcements before we get out of here. We've already had church, we've already prayed. Just wanted to remind everybody that we're going to do this special youth service tomorrow night. If you've got somebody that wants to be here 12 and up, we're going to talk about sex is not a game. Okay, get, get, get into some nitty gritty about what the Word of God says and basically what needs to be happening in our lives. Amen. It's 12 and up, don't forget about that. Uh, also, the last Sunday of this month, we're going to be doing a baptism service. So if you know people who will need to be water baptized, start spreading the word, and we can get people signed up for that, that would be great. Amen? Listen, I call you blessed. Have a great week.